Right. Hi, everybody. Oh, that, that works. Good. It's nice to have everybody here today. Thank you for bearing with us. We're a couple of minutes behind. Um, as it happens, we've had all sorts of fun difficulties come up in the last moments, but we should be rolling now. Um, it's, it's fun, though, isn't it, sometimes dealing uh, with really old buildings. That's what we have mostly today. So a lot of our AV equipment, in fact, the vast majority of it, is locked in my colleague's office right now. And uh, her key broke off in her lock this morning. That has happened to almost every single one of us that works in the Carnegie building. They're 80 year old doors. And so now Caitlin is part of the club, I guess. It's, it's happened to her now, too. Uh, but we, we've cobbled it together. And so uh, thank you for, for those on Zoom for bearing with us. Um, we'll do our best to make sure you can see and hear us. So uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. First of all, uh, if we don't see you again over the next week, uh, hope you all have fun plans. Uh, a couple of really brief announcements before we get started. I hope everybody has had the opportunity to see uh, our wonderful new art exhibit upstairs. It's called Layers of a Town, works by Roy Reynolds. And if you haven't seen it yet, I uh, encourage you to do so. It'll be here for mid-February, so you, you don't have to do it today necessarily. Uh, but it's a lovely exhibit uh, from an, an extraordinarily important and wonderful local artist uh, who, of course, just passed away uh, in September of this year. And it's a, an exhibit dedicated to uh, his view of Idaho Falls on his, uh, and, and the history of Idaho Falls as seen through his brush and his canvas. And there's some lovely work up there. Uh, that has some fantastic local ties, and, and especially for those of you who have lived here a long time, I think you'll find a lot to, uh, to recognize in that. So um, we hope you see that. Uh, if uh, For those of you who are members of the museum, hopefully you also saw the uh, email that went out a couple of days ago announcing our next two big uh, special exhibits in our traveling exhibit hall. Uh, we are really, really looking forward to our lineup for 2022. So we have starting on January 22nd, Genghis Khan, Culture and Conquest, and uh, really should be a lot of fun. A number of firsts for us here. Uh, the first Asia-focused exhibit we've ever held at the museum. Um, it, of course, takes uh, immerses the visitor in uh, essentially 13th century Mongolia and the Mongolian Empire, which Genghis Khan founded uh, in a rather brutal fashion, but was the largest land empire in history. And in fact, Washington Post historians uh, at, at the dawn of this millennium, uh, came together and uh, elected Genghis Khan as the single most influential person of the entire last millennium, which is which is saying something. Uh, and and that's due to his creation of this massive empire, as well as the cultural and scientific advancements that he spread throughout the empire as well. So there's a lot of there's a lot of brutality and there's a lot of beauty involved. In him. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, another first uh, that we are going to see in this exhibit that we haven't had here at the museum before is daily live performances uh, of traditional Mongolian music. And uh, we're really looking forward to that as well. So uh, that's January through September. And then uh, September 30th next year, we will be opening Toytopia. And uh, Toytopia should be a lot of fun as well. This takes visitors through the, uh, the history and science of toys and games uh, going back from uh, ancient times up until today. Uh, it's heavy on the nostalgia factor. If you lived in the 20th century at some point, you will see toys in that exhibit that you owned uh, or that you coveted at least. And um, all sorts of fun, interactive, playable uh, toys and games in there as well. The world's largest etch a sketch, which you can actually use. I can't even use a regular sized one, uh, as well as uh, one of those pianos from the movie Big, essentially play with your feet, uh, life-size dollhouse, all sorts of fun, uh, large games that you can play, and regular-sized games as well. Um, uh, 70s and 80s arcade, uh, you can actually play the video games. Anyway, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, if you call us uh, and we don't answer our phones, we'll probably be playing <laughs> games, so just, just kind of. Um, okay, so without further ado, I um, would like to introduce our program today. So this is a special program that we actually that came on request. And so uh, 
don't let it be said that I don't answer your request. If you have something that you would like to hear about here at the museum, well, please do let me know. Let any one of us on the staff know, and we will do our best to make it happen. Uh, Bill Doring and Jericho Whiting have presented uh, in a number of places before, I understand. Uh, but one of our visitors saw them present at the Idaho Falls Zoo and was so blown away uh, by what he saw here, there, that uh, wanted to bring it here as well. And, and to the zoo's credit, I called up Dave Pound, uh, the, the director of the zoo, and, and I said, is it okay if we bring these two in? And he said, of course, the more education in the community, the better, which I thought was very generous. So um, we're even, even if we are stealing this thunder a little bit. Um, anyhow, uh, so I'm going to introduce these two. Jericho Whiting, first of all, uh, is an associate professor of wildlife ecology at BYU Idaho. And his research focuses on wildlife and habitat conservation. He's conducted research with several local organizations uh, and, and beyond uh, to better understand bats and conserve them and their habitat here in eastern Idaho. And he has, in fact, co-authored a paper with Dave Pinnock at the zoo, as well as with our other speaker today, Bill Doring. Uh, and Bill is a wildlife and bat biologist uh, who conducts research and supports wildlife management and conservation programs at the Idaho National Laboratory. He's been researching bats since the early 1990s. Uh, interests include resource requirements of mammals, bat behavior, long-term trends in local bat populations, emerging threats to bats, and searching for the rare spotted bat, as well as a few more. Uh, he, and I suspect possibly Jericho as well, helped found an East Idaho Bat Monitoring Collaborative uh, that is known as the Fellowship of the Wing. So they are nerds as well, and we're happy to have that here. Um, and uh, he enjoys educating the public and countering negative attitudes about these fascinating and valuable mammals that we have right here with us. So uh, without further ado, we're going to turn it over to uh, Bill Doring first and then Jericho White to talk about ecology and conservation of bats in Southern Idaho. Just the appropriate distance to get everything. Okay. Generally doesn't go up microphones, but we'll see how it goes. All right. So um, in putting this together, I was trying to think of what a, a museum crowd would be interested in. So I took the, the core talk that I give at the Idaho Falls Zoo, and I just kind of pushed up around and keep it and stand up and stuff. That's kind of like Really quick, if we're trying to get people outside and actually see bats in the zoo. Okay. So I'm going to talk about, uh, well, I think I have a slide. Does anyone want to talk about? First of all, a quote um, from Bats in the United States and Canada. There are very negative attitudes towards bats that are pervasive in most cultures. And, um, and I grew up in a world where if you, if you switch the bat and kill the bat and you hit a bat in the room, you're doing public service. Because they all have rabies. Um, and you get clear mat addicts or you get fan in mind, you know, it's like everyone's duty to kill bats. And uh, I think that one of the best things you can do for bat conservation is stop people from doing that. So, all the other stuff we do, all the research is probably secondary to convincing people that bats aren't evil monsters. Okay. So that's what I kind of tried to do. All right. So I'm going to talk a bit about bats and culture, um, just high level basic bat biology, and I'll focus on a couple of areas that I think are particularly interesting and, and, and uh, particularly unique to bats. Um, I'll grade towards an overview of Idaho bats. I'll talk about benefits of bats, and I'll kind of preview threats to bats, which will segue into, into Jericho's talk. Okay. Okay, so uh, there are lots of negative bat attitudes in Western society, and has anyone seen shows of Survivor? No one's ever seen this movie, it's amazing. 1800 feet underground, a perfect world, program for advanced survival, except for bats. Um, you guys know Bat Boy? No? Anyone? Is, is, how about the Hammer uh, Dracula movies from the 50s? You guys remember that? Okay, sorry. So, negative use of bats. Uh, the, the term or the word bat 
first appears in English around 1570. It appears to have migrated over from a Swedish word, baka, that's related to bacon. And in, in Middle German, the word for that was speckmaus, which literally means bacon mouse. And it's unclear if it's thought because they would hang in sheds and barns where cured meats also hung, and so they were found in association with each other, or because of the way bats look while they're roosting and they're hanging with their wings, if they look like a ham or a side of bacon. Um, they were blamed for eating bacon and hams, and so there was, there was the beginning of bat persecution in the Middle Ages because they thought the bats were eating the bacon. Um, and I found a little nursery rhyme that you're free to read on your own there while I'm talking uh, about bats and bacon. And most European words um, for bat are related to how they move, um, when they're active in the evening, the leathery appearance, um, and their similar, similarity to rodents. You may have heard like slater mouse, flutter mouse, flitter mouse is often a term for bats, or airy mouse, um, sky mouse. Um, the Latin word uh, Vespertilio, I think, vaguely translates to little evening ones, which is kind of a feudal name. So, anyway, uh, and I found this uh, it's from an illuminated manuscript from the Middle Ages, and it's uh, Alexander the Great's exploits in Asia. And you can see some pretty vicious looking bats in that imagery. And if you go to the New World, um, this has been identified as like the real origin of Batman, and Kama Zot is the deaf bat that guarded the underworld in caves, and there are all sorts, sorts of scary folk tales of him murdering people at night and, and brutally eating people and things. If we go to the Far East in China, uh, the word bat and the word for good luck or good fortune uh, are are humble point, they sound the same. And so over time, the bat came to represent good luck or good fortune. It represented the, what were called the, uh, the five blessings of health, wealth, virtue, tranquility, and peaceful life and old age. You see a lot of uh, art with um, what's the tree of life in the center. Has anyone seen Kung Fu Panda? I just can't get the right crowd. Okay. <laughs> all right. If there were eight year olds here, they would know all about that. And then the five bats around it. So if you see a lot of symbolism like this, it's this woo foo. So when you can Google it, find all kinds of cool, cool imagery. This one I thought was particularly cool, and I want to recreate it uh, from my patio behind our house. And it's a terracotta woo foo symbol, which I think is really lovely. Keeping with the Things that museum people might like to see. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so bat origins. Uh, the oldest complete bat fossil, uh, fossil is from about uh, 52 and a half uh, million years ago in Wyoming. And there are other fossils uh, around the world that are from about the same time, and they reflect that bats had a global distribution approximately 50 million years ago. Uh, molecular work indicates that they appeared around 60 million years ago, and they probably based on some uh, teeth that were found in some river sediments, um, probably in Asia is where they originated. Okay, and the reason I'm telling you all that is because every, almost every global terrestrial ecosystem evolved in the presence of bats, and bats are integral components to all of these systems. There's a bat component in almost every ecosystem. About a quarter of mammals and bats were up close to 1,400 species now. They used to be in, uh, you may recall, the mega chiroptera and the micro chiroptera. Are those familiar terms, you guys? Yeah, sort of maybe. Um, but some molecular work, uh, we found that there were actually six families that were put in the micro chiroptera that were actually closer to the mega chiroptera. So there's been some recent reworking into two groups, the pteropodiformes, which is the megabats or six microbats, and then the vespertilioniformes. So those are the two big groups of bats. And we'll, we'll mainly talk about the microbats, one group of the vespertilioniformes, the vespertilioniformes today. Okay. 
Uh, most species of bats are insectivorous. However, there's lots of specialization. They're pollen, nectar, fruit, blood feeders. They're bats that catch fish. They're bats that catch frogs. They're bats that eat other bats. There are bats that catch uh, at least one species of bat that catch uh, birds on the wing. There's a European bat they recently found will go up thousand feet at night and then will dive into flocks of migrating passerines and take them on the wing, which is pretty fascinating. Recent discovery. Okay. All the what well, best for bats use pharyngeal echolocations, which means they use they create noise in their throat. And they use the echoes from those voyages to navigate. Okay. Uh, general anatomy. Just a couple of things while you're looking at this, I want to point out is the wing is not simply skin stretched out across their bones, it's a very complex structure with, with a, a vascular system with muscles and nerves. It's, it's a controlled flight surface. They can tense it, they can pleat it, uh, they can tuck it up when they fold their wings. So it's not simply skin. All right. Uh, a couple other structures I want to point out are a uh, something called a tragus, which is in your ear. I think it was a trigger nail. Just give it a try. Right there. Uh, there's a little projection that sticks up in their ear, and it creates sort of a acoustical crosshairs as they sweep their head back and forth. Another structure I want to point out is a calcar, which is sort of a bony projection that comes off their heel. And it lets them control this membrane. And so they can use this membrane as an air brake. They can use it as a feeding structure. They can use it to steer by tensing it and changing its shape. Okay. I have a question about it. Yes. I noticed they had a thumb and the second, third, fourth, and fifth finger. Yes. Do have the first finger? Uh, the, I guess that first finger would be the thumb. Okay. Yeah. And then since we're back on this slide, <laughs> so this bone here is not a finger bone. It's actually one of their metacarpals. So their quarter of knuckles would be there, there, and there. So the hand is actually expanded, not just the finger to create the wing. Okay. Okay, only through flying mammals. Uh, Choroptera is the order of these hand wing. Most of them can vary their body temperature, their heterothermic, which means uh, they can uh, raise and lower their temperature behavior, not behaviorally, but, but uh, with effort by controlling their T set point. Most use daily pork torpor. So when they're not active, they lower their body temperatures. Many hibernate. Uh, we mentioned uh, echolocation, which is a form of biosonar. And their body shapes and their wing shapes vary quite a bit depending on their lifestyle. There are some that have short, wide wings and they can hover, fly backwards, like this one. And there are those with very long, narrow wings. They're almost like boomerangs. They can fly really fast, like this one. And this one is the Brazilian freetail bat. Used to be called the Mexican freetail bat. You may think it's okay. They actually found out that they were speaking Portuguese. <laughs> so, um, anyway, they have the uh, the record for straight level flight in vertebrates 100 miles an hour. So, not to dive, not in any kind of maneuver, just flying, flat out flying. Okay, uh, we're going to slowly zoom in and talk about the kinds of bats that are in Idaho and Idaho bats. So, temperate insectivorous bats are the group that we're at now. Okay, very diverse foraging strategies, they roost in a variety of places. Uh, cliffs, trees, in foliage, mines, buildings. They use habitat at large scale. Even though they're physically small, they may travel many miles each night. They're long lived, upwards of 20, 40 years. They all, uh, but almost all of them, uh, use hibernation. They have very low reproductive rates. Maybe a single pup, some do twinning a year. And they function in the ecosystem like they're much bigger. So if you look at lifespan, home range sizes, and the number of offspring a female will produce in her lifetime, they're more like grizzly bears. Okay. So you can kind of think of them as tiny flying grizzly bears. Maybe not. Okay. Uh, they breed in the fall, and the female stores sperm over winter. They become pregnant in the spring. And in Idaho, we have two species that migrate out of state, the rest 
or at least regional residents. Okay. Uh, I mentioned thermal mobility and daily corporate. Why don't you focus? Yes, go ahead. Uh, what determines their habitat? Roosting and prey or something else? Um, <clears throat> if you put together um, roost habitat, whether it's an often rocky vertical structure like trees or rocky habitat or something, and water, of water components in an appropriate scale. And then um, often woody vegetation, trees or shrubs, and kind of put those together at some spatial scale, it makes it a bad habitat. So it could be a forest with ponds, it could be a river and a canyon with shrubs and cliffs, it could be um, arroyos and washes and cattle ponds and rock piles. Um, it could be badlands and then and then you know water at the bottom or something. But you put those three pieces together in some way, and it usually makes good bad habitat. So, does that kind of fit your your question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So high ranges and extreme cases of torpor with body temperature or down regulation plus the freezing, and it requires uh, precise environmental conditions. So the environmental conditions can't vary much because they can't freeze. It's also very highly organized behaviorally and allows bats to conserve energy and water during winter conditions. Okay, so make a note of energy and water because I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. So the habitat for high is crucial for survival. This is a little bit from my thesis work, and the only thing I wanted to get out of this is this is November and this is January from the same winter. And this is the the distribution of temperatures being used by the bats early and then later in the winter. And it seems for the whole colony, I think this was 120, 21 bats, this was about 140, same cave. Um, and this is what the temperature availability looked like. Okay, so they're very precise in what they're using within the cave. And in this case here, almost all the bats are down close to zero degrees centigrade. Okay, so they're all below one and a half degrees, or many of them are below one and a half degrees for their reason. Okay. So it's not haphazard, they're not spinning it. And if you look at the relationship between their body temperatures and the temperatures of their roofs, so this is the, the x equals y line. So above this line is residual metabolism, or our measure of residual metabolism, like how much warmer they are in the environment. So they sort of track going down, but then when they get down close to freezing, they're sort of predominantly down here. And they'll be down here, even if they have to jack their metabolism up if they get too cold. And I believe this was a, a mechanism to save water, because most of our caves are dry. So water loss is very important during hibernation. <clears throat> so now I want to talk about echolocation. All our bats are, are insectivorous echolocators. I defined this previously. Um, all one of our species uses ultrasonic frequencies, so above the range of our hearing. So the high frequencies let me detect small objects, but ultrasound doesn't go through the air very well. It attenuates. So the air is kind of seepy to ultrasound, so they can't detect that goes very far away. So they can't detect their prey very far away. And this puts a constraint on their body size because they need to be maneuverable to chase insects, but they can't detect those insects until they're very close. To them. That's why most of our bats are small. Okay. If they use low frequencies, they get a longer range, they have less detail, so they could detect small prey. And they couldn't get details from those prey. There's something called the one half rule, which states that the target must be one half the wavelength for a set. So fix to sound divided by the frequency, you get the wavelength. So one half, you can quickly, quickly figure out what size prey you're looking for based on the frequencies. Okay. So let's see if I can uh, play this. Let's think by this clock, right? Sure. This is what ultrasound sounds, sounds like.
Yeah. So they produce a series of short duration FM <coughs> frequency modulated sweeps, and there's about six to ten per second. So they go on chirping as they go. And as they uh, encounter an object of interest, they get closer together. So they have search calls and they have approach calls. And you may have heard like little zipper sounds in that recording. Those are feeding buzzes. So here's an example of a feeding buzz here. So this is this is just raw data. The data looks like raw data. So trip, 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 they get closer, the bandwidth increases, and this is probably a prey capture. Then they go back to searching. Okay, and they do that all the time. So they get um, information on tire size, distance, speed, wind speed. They get surface features actually. And their calls are specialized to target prey, prey in specific habitats. And they vary based on that species, the prey presence, and the structure of the habitat, or how much physical clutter is in the habitat. So the calls are constantly changing. And these are some examples of different species in their bat calls. Okay. You can use the pulse shape. So this is a chirp, stylized. And you can use it to try to figure out bats are based on diagnostic features. Okay. And you can develop keys based on libraries of known calls and try to group them based on what you think they are. And there's software that you program. There's actually group entry auto identification software. Okay. And you can also um, program these past detectors that operate on the for a long period of time. Okay. Fast by no. There's uh, 47 species in North America. We have 14 in Idaho. Here's 14. I'm going to talk about a few of them. Okay. This is a Western long myotis, and this is a hoary bat. So, hoary bat is a uh, high forager, generally forest habitat, very swift flyer, not very maneuverable, roosts by itself, <coughs> feeds on large prey, primarily moths. And uses low frequency at low base, also it's looking for big stuff. And it's a miter. Silver here bat um, forages in woodlands over ponds. Really a slow flyer. If you can get one in a, in a spotlight, they look really lazy when they're flying. They look like, like grandpa from Monsters or something. They're kind of like walking along. Okay. Um, they roost in trees, but they generally roost um, under bark or tree grass. Okay. Generally solitary. The big brown bat uh, has been called the coyote of bats. Great generals. Found lots of places, will eat anything. Um, roost someone anywhere. Um, takes larger prey. It has highly variable echolocation problems. Uh, here's kind of bigger bat, very cute. They got these little fleshy bumps that stick up for their eyes. <coughs> this is the Hubbard leaner. So it takes uh, insects directly from woody vegetation. So it'll forage against tree trunks or um, in shrubs and actually pick insects out. And then also in boulders. Um, and they're a low uh, volume call. So they're often hard to detect. And Easter Idaho appears to be a hot spot for species. Little brown bat. And uh, it's more correctly called the brown myotis, but it's uh, one of the most common bats, so it's really regularly called the little brown myotis. Is there a plant that you're drinking water? Sorry, sorry to show you. So it's seen in a diverse habitat, habitat type, often near open water. It'll also forage in open spaces, um, <clears throat> takes a variety of insects, and it's experienced dramatic decline because of white dust syndrome. The Western smallfoot myotis is the most commonly bat detected in our area. Very cute little guy. <laughs> Typically forages close to vegetation, so it flies around shrubs. 
The flight's erratic, so it's chasing little tiny things instead of ducking and diving and twisting and turning and chasing them. But you see them, they usually are moving frantically in every direction it wants to do. Let's see if the shutter is shot right there. Um, they typically roots are rock crevices. And then recently, uh, we've gotten spot bass in the night. We didn't know we had them. And this was at one time considered one of the rarest North American animals. And they're just spectacular. <clears throat> they've got huge ears. Um, they've got white spots on their back. They're a very cool bat. I'll talk a little bit about horse bats. They're a major portion of mammalian biodiversity. <clears throat> In many ecosystems, they're top predators. Long live, I mentioned earlier. They provide important ecological and agricultural services. They're key pollinators in some ecosystems and they disperse seeds. Um, they're important for nutrient redistribution and cycling. And they're being studied extensively for human health and biology. Aging, immune systems, uh, heliocentric stress, etc. There's a lot of words up there. So they eat lots of insects. The bottom line is they eat lots of insects. Now, lactate females can eat more than four times their weight each evening. Um, and they found through studies that they um, will key on agricultural pests and they will, will, will reduce pest loads and therefore reduce the number of sprays that are needed, which reduce the, the pesticides on our food, pesticides in our water, and pesticides going into the ecosystem. And they also save uh, nationwide in order of $23 billion a year in pesticides not used. And agriculture uh, largely doesn't recognize that there's, I've seen some work in California trying to encourage bats to forage over egg fields. But generally, they're uh, <coughs> isn't as recognized. Okay. Um, <coughs> they found um, not only do they reduce Pest loads, but they also reduce crop damage. So they increase the value of the crop. And they're also in, in the tropics, they're important pollinators for a number of uh, economically important plants, including bananas, cacao, guava, fig seeds, cashews, agave, and mangoes. They also are what are called nutrient cyclers. So they, they feed in nutrient dense areas. And they roost in nutrient poor areas. So they move nutrients against gradients. Okay. <clears throat> so they'll bring nutrients into caves. Um, there are tropical trees that have adventitious roots that grow in their own tree holes. And so when bats roost in there, they'll pick up nutrients from bat guano in their tree holes. So they kind of self feed from the bats. There are uh, pitcher plants in Borneo. That have an acoustical signature that the bats recognize, and the bats actually roost inside the pitcher plant and feed the plant in the little in the little pitcher. Okay. As I said, they're very long lived. And uh, this figure, this is if this this line is the predicted age based on body mass, and this is all the mammals. These are the bats. So they live much longer than you would predict based on their body size. <clears throat> the record is 42 years, which is pretty good. Okay. They also are able to maintain muscle tone and function during long periods of activity. Um, they have their total uh, mobility appears to reduce energy requirements. Um, they maintain sensory acuity and road capacity their entire life. So a very old bat has to still be a bat, has to be able to fly, has to be able to do all things a bat does. Um, they appear to have unique modifications to certain genes. And they're very good at handling in, intracellular pathogens, viruses. 
So they'll mount a strong antiviral response, <clears throat> but they won't have a strong inflammatory response. And this has been studied recently because of COVID, because that's what gets us, is that what they call it, that cytokine cascade or cytokine storm, I think they call it in the media. And so apparently bats can mount their immune system response and then not have their immune system go crazy at the same time. So we want to know how they do that. Okay, threats, real fast. <clears throat> Habitat alteration, habitat loss. <clears throat> um, this is burdock, and so bats will come in and forage in the evening, and they'll be close to the vegetation, and they'll stick on it, and they'll get stuck and die. This is a cave that got choked out by a Russian missile, and it was a hibernation site. Now it's not because the bats came in. Um, habitat conversion, structural habitat is important, and if they can't forage over the habitat, they can't use it anymore. So this is like a weedy monoculture. Um, this is a habitat island of juniper. And there's a lot of this going on in the West where people are ripping out junipers. I saw an LA Times article where they're estimating an area the size of Vermont is going to be removed in the West of junipers by the Bureau of Land Management. And so all that habitat won't be vertical woody structure vegetation and they'll hold bats anymore. Wind energy, apparently wind and bats don't mix. Um, this is a hoary bat that got chopped. <clears throat> so we first started noticing this when the wind turbines started getting really big around 2003, that there was a problem. And uh, nationwide it's probably seven to 12 bats per megawatt. <clears throat> and it's mostly quarry bats, but then it's a hodgepodge of the other ones. They appear to be attracted, but no one knows why they're being attracted to the turbines. And they're already detecting population declines. And then white nose. You guys know what white nose syndrome is? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. These are dead bats in a cave in Vermont. So white nose is a, is a fungal pathogen that appeared. In 2006, in a cave, a commercial cave, a, a tourist cave near Albany, New York, and it has spread all over the country. <clears throat> and it causes energetic and water stress. And earlier I said how important both those things are for hibernation survival. So if they weren't hibernating, it wouldn't be a problem because they're hibernating, they die. That usually occurs 79 days. Um, there are impacts to agriculture that are being reported because the bats aren't eating pests. And the latest I saw was it's wiped out 90% of three species of bats. One of them is a little brown bat. And this is a map, a county scale map of where it's been detected so far. So we're kind of in a hole, but we're surrounded. And that was detected in three bats. Right on. I think that's it. Okay. Questions, comments? Yes. The early slides caught my attention and the number of species was like 1,300 or something around the world. That's astonishing. <laughs> yeah. And we have like 50 in North America and it looks like they're 17. Yeah, we've got uh, 14 in America. Yeah. That number of species. So I'm assuming that. The vast majority of them are in the tropics and the species. Majority of them, um, yes. <clears throat> yeah, there are more bats in Costa Rica than all of North America. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so. And evolutionarily speaking, what's a common ancestor? How did they evolve? Uh, they are a pretty far back stem group. They said they were closer to the primates, but they're actually now pretty far away from the top primates. So, there's a, uh, a group of mammals that evolved in Laurasia, which is sort of an ancient supercontinent. And there are a number of groups that are in there the hoof animals, the carnivores, pangolins, whales. Um, and so they're sort of like the those mammals, or closer to those. So, 
Uh, we have a question on the Zoom. Uh, it says, would global warming be a benefit? Global warming, excuse me, be a benefit for bats threatened by white nose syndrome if it reduces the length of the cold season and duration of hibernation and also increases humidity because of the warmer air? Um, that's a complicated question. Um, so they're selecting temperatures based on their what they've evolved to select. And the three species that are most at risk. Just so happy, you know, I showed that curve of what my bats were doing. So my bats are much older than the bats that are being hammered by white nose. They're a few degrees warmer. So if you look at the growth curve for um, for the, the, the fungus, pseudodium nilaskus and destructens, it looks like the temperature selection curve for the brown bat. So they are like right in the sweet spot where the fungus grows best. And so I don't know if, um, well, caves are generally sluggish, giving an overly long end when it's all good, but they, they, they generally have a high capacity to absorb a change in the outside environment. In some caves, you go back far enough, but it's not in this ice age climate back in the cave. So there will be a climate change lag. Um, and those bats will probably still be moving around to find appropriate temperatures. So, um, and then the fungus does really well with higher humidities. So, uh, I don't have the name of it. I apologize. Uh, another question on the Zoom uh, has come in How is the white nose syndrome spread? Uh, it appears it's, it's predominantly back to back. They're spreading it probably in the fall when they um, are swarming and there's courtship going on, and you get multiple species all roosting together and hanging out together um, pre hibernation. And so they're spreading on each other. Um, some of these larger caves that have, that have had lots of bats is in the cave. So it's become endemic in the cave. And so they can probably infect when they go in. Uh, but if, if the space doesn't have very many bats, it probably doesn't have a very high formal load. So places that have just one or two or three or four or five or 20 bats may not be as impacted. It's like country bat versus urban bat. Um, you know, you see those models for like zombie apocalypse and it's in New York, Montana. Um, because the population has to be so low, but New York, yeah. Um, anyway, so it's kind of like that. Okay, there was another hand in that. Go. Yes. Um, so, kind of on the white nose fungus topic, does it affect agents in bats more than serious in bats? Uh, yes, it does. It doesn't appear to affect, um, well, there's some that summer in trees and they hibernate in caves. Okay. So, the bats that are wintering in caves are the ones that are being affected. Okay. Is that it? Else? Okay, we'll get more questions. I'll be here. <laughs> All right, my hand is Jericho, and let's see, you can probably find your talk. And All right. Everyone, right? It's a uh, good to be here. Uh, special thanks to Bill. He does a great job providing just good basic information about bats, bat biology, and um, does a great job teaching about the uniqueness of bats and their ecosystem functioning, right? Which is pretty powerful. I, Bill and I have been working with bats now for probably, he can like 20, 30 years, me and him together, probably 10, 12, 15 years now. And so I'm gonna focus a little more on some of the research we're conducting. Uh, centered on the Idaho National Laboratory site, where we collaborate with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, the BLM, uh, the IFSU quite a bit. And um, this has allowed us then to get a good understanding of the of bats in southern Idaho so that we can conserve this, those species that occur here and their habitat. So 
So Bill talked about this a little bit, but southeastern Idaho is based on geological features. This is a volcanic uh, pseudocarst, which uh, produces caves like this. You've all probably been in caves out here on the desert or craters of the moon. Absolutely uh, fantastic bat habitat. If you take a look across the western uh, United States and even up into Canada, Idaho, southeastern Idaho has some of the best bat habitat in all of western North America. Right here in our southeastern Idaho, I can drive out on the desert and it's incredible the number of caves out there. You guys have all been to craters, right? It's just incredible. And all that, and this kind of goes back to the climate change question, it provides a whole diversity of habitat that then bats can use and they can adjust to different seasons and climates and all kinds of things like that. So um, we sit in an extremely important area for bat conservation in Western North America. Uh, Bill talked about this, so I'm not going to go into that, but there are several species that have been petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. Little Brown Myotis is one that occurs here in Idaho. A decision will probably come out on that next year, we've been told. And that'll change then the way in which we study bats and the way in which we conserve and, and manage bats and their habitats potentially. Now I'm going to switch and talk about some of the specific projects we've done together. So we know that southeastern Idaho is an important area for bats, right? We don't have too much information about how wind energy here is going to affect the bat populations. And Bill and I, this is probably five years ago now, Bill, right? Like we were we got an email from a biologist from the Idaho Park Fishing Game, and she said that some of the wind companies have hired private consulting companies to come in and do surveys, post construction surveys, to see how many birds and bats they were killing. The wind farm east of town here, the Rockland wind farm was the number one. And I can't remember the third one, somewhere around here. But they said, we've got a bunch of bats, carcasses. Do you guys want them? They said that to the biologist. She's like, sure, yeah, we can, we can take a look at them and use them. They brought over how many bags? Do you remember? Three, four? Three or four black garbage bags full of bat carcasses. <laughs> And you gotta remember when they're doing their wind, wind turbine surveys, they don't go underneath each turbine. They'll randomly select about 10% or some per percentage. And um, so Bill and I and this biologist and another biologist sat there for three straight days, just picking carcasses out and trying to identify what they were, right? So um, these were three facilities from 2012 to 2014, and the carcasses were only collected for two years. And these are the carcasses that we identified that Bill talked about 46% of those were horned bats, we had silver haired bats, big brown bats, the little brown myotis. We were surprised about this one. This is higher than most places in the Western US, and this one was interesting too. Based on what we could glean, though, some of the wind farms around here have some of the highest mortalities of bats in the Western US. We know California has some places that are pretty high, but the wind farms around here have some uh, pretty high more top rates. Yes. So these percentages are not proportional to their abundance. No, it's so like the higher than the boring Yes, it'll be it'll be higher in the migrant the migrating tree bats, the boring silver hair bats. And that's consistent pretty much across anywhere you go and you look at this these kind of data. They're flying higher, we'll talk about this. They're flying higher, they're migrating, and they're being attracted to the turbines. Some of these other ones, like the big brown bats, uh, we suspected that the turbines were built in an area that was really good habitat for that species, and that's why it was going to be locally the number of parks we saw. Hibernacular surveys. So these are fun, right? That's Bill right there, actually, back in the day, 10 years ago, right? Bill's going to crawl through that hole right there. Like, this is where you go out in the middle of the winter, in the winter, in the middle of the desert, and crawl in little teeny holes <laughs> and count bats. We were doing this on the INL site, and there's a cave on the INL site called Green Sausage Cave. Bill's been in it, right? right? <laughs> so you can imagine. 
I went down into a larger crater, and the hole was about this big. And it was covered in rocks, and I was pulling rocks away, and I was like, I am not going in that thing. Like, there's no way. And then you shimmy through that hole, and it's about kind of like that, right? No, it goes back like five or six, seven feet like that, and then it opens up in a big cavern, and then it constricts back down like a link sausage, right? So, oh, I, but I had a couple of the biologists with me, and I'm just like, okay, I'm not going in that hole. I've been stuck in caves behind people that were bigger than me. Picked it out right, and um, yeah, that's not good, but anyway, we got we did go in. And you go to these caves, you've probably all been in these types of caves, they just open up almost like a, a, a subway, right? And it's and then we just walk along, and the bats are hanging like fruit from a tree, right? Some species that counts as bigger bats, we count them very well. The other guys, a little western small foot of my house, would be crammed up in the cracks and stuff, and so you have to look around. And, um, it's absolutely just fabulous being in caves and counting bats, right? And some of the caves we go into will be in there four to five hours just setting up transects, counting bats. And from all that, we get really good data that help us track these guys. Okay, this, these are the towns that's bigger bats. We don't know a lot about what they do in hibernation, we don't know a lot about their behavior and also their numbers. And they usually only have made uh, like a few number of individuals per cave. We consider a significant hibernaculum as a cave in which we would count greater than 20 bats. Okay. Same thing with the Western small foot of Myotis. They hibernate small numbers. So we consider the significant hibernaculum for these guys with, when we would go in and count more than five bats. So this figure shows number of bats on Y all the way up to 600 and all these different caves that occur out here in the desert. From here to Shoshone. The red line indicates the 20 bat cutoff. And so we have uh, probably the highest density of caves for this species in all of Western North America. Some of our caves have 600, 500, bats in them, some of the largest hibernaculum in Western North America for this species. In fact, we have one cave that's not on here where you can count 2,000 of these individuals in the winter. That was our highest count. It was 1994, actually. The most counted for any cave in Western North America. So we have the highest density of caves for these, this guy and some of the highest hibernating populations of this species in all of Western North America. Western small footed myelis is the same story. Number of bats on, y, uh, on the y axis caves. We have uh, the highest density of caves in Western North America for these guys, and some with up to 140, which is a large number of bats for these guys. So, uh, looking at population trends, it's often difficult to track populations of animals across time. You either need to have them tagged. Right, or you need to have some feature like a cave which they'll fly in consistently, and then across years you can go in and count and try to understand the trends. Right, we don't know a lot of what's going on in Western North America about this, and so this is absolutely critical, right, for conservation of wildlife. You have got to know what the populations are doing, right? Are they increasing, decreasing, or remaining stable? Bill did a great job talking about white nose, wind, habitat destruction. How is all that affecting that population, right? Those are great questions that we have. So we took this data set, it was 30 years of data, a whole bunch of uh, surveys. And basically we were able to go back to about 1985, up to about 2018. And this is just a relative abundance or just a relative number of bats across like 60 caves. And we did some fancy statistical model and basically showed that across the past 30 years, this species is actually doing fairly well, right? There's a little bit of a dip there, but overall, this black line here is the average trend. They're doing fairly well. This is powerful data, right? Because now, if this automatically drops for some reason, we can actually look back to the past 30 years and have a baseline for which we can understand the population trend. We looked at this also with Western small footed myotis. These are the guys that we suspect will get um, whacked by white nose syndrome when it comes to Idaho. You see a 
somewhat of a similar type of trend. There was a dip there, but they rebounded. That might just be natural fluctuation. But once again, from here on out, if, if when white nose comes, not if, but when we get white nose in our caves, we would actually predict that these guys would drop, right? And so now we'll be able to test that and use statistics to show the degree of that increase. Winter activity. So bats, back in the day, a lot of bat researchers would, wouldn't do a lot of work in the winter. Bill tells me it's because it's cold and nobody wants to bat the cave in the winter, right? It's difficult to get a lot of these caves. But bats will go into hibernation and they'll, they'll have a torpor and then they arouse from that and they'll fly out of the cave in the winter and then fly back in. They do this. We didn't know a lot about this until about eight, five, eight years ago. We started doing a bunch of work on this. And there's a whole bunch of hypotheses. They're drinking, they're feeding, they're mating, they're urinating, they're changing positions, moving around and such. We didn't know the pattern of that, and we didn't have a clear understanding of how frequently they were flying out. And this could have evolutionary underpinnings, right? Because if you're a female bat, as Bill talked about, you uh, come out of hibernation, you initiate pregnancy, lactation, Right? And so if you're a female bat and you can arouse and fly out and assess the conditions, and if conditions are good, selection would favor individuals that could assess that quickly and then start the reproductive process, right? And this is a big one for white male syndrome. So white male syndrome basically generally causes bats to arouse from hibernation and it, it agitates them and then they arouse and burn energy. And, and they lose water and then they die. They don't have enough energy to make it through the winter because they're arousing and waking up and flying out at, at abnormal rates than what they normally do. So we set a whole bunch of these detectors at the INL site. This is the uh, recorder here, the microphone. We'll talk about that. Just picks up echolocation calls of bats like Bill showed. This is what we documented bat activity on why this is bats flying outside of caves in the middle of winter. You hear our months, November, December, January, February, March. Townsend's bigger than that in gray, Western small footed in white. They're active every single month, which is surprising, right? Uh, sometimes on the outside, it can be negative 20 with the wind blowing, right? And all throughout the winter, these guys are flying out, assessing conditions, and flying out of the caves. These detectors are set up. There's our technician, right? Bill and I, we don't do this stuff. It's too cold. We send Brian, our technician, up to set up bat detectors in the middle of winter, right? And now we have a baseline here of behavior. So when white nose syndromes, when when white nose syndrome hits, we have to compare it back to this and with. Uh, Western smallfoot and myotis, these guys with the, the white bars, that behavior might start changing dramatically, potentially, if they're affected with white nose And you can see here, this is temperature, this is uh, wind and barometric pressure, number of other bats. Basically, now we have all this baseline data of when bats should be flying out during a certain barometric pressure, temperature, wind, you name it. Normally, this is what they should be doing. With white nose, they might be used to doing something totally different than what they normally do. This is pretty powerful data then to help us understand that change of behavior. Uh, another thing we um, are doing is we're, we're getting an activity pattern of bats. So we set these detectors up outside a cave. We record them coming out of the cave, and then we go in and count the bats in the cave. And we wondered if we could predict the number of bats based on the acoustic recordings if we could actually predict the number that were in the caves. So then we wouldn't have to go into caves to count bats because us going into caves can disturb bats. It can cause them to arouse. And also humans can, can cause or transmit white ones, right? Through us going into caves and moving things around and such. So for example, if we set detectors all winter long and got a, um, an average, of bat activity 20, for example, that we could use this regression model and come up and say that actually equates to about 17 bats with the standard error, right? So you could, across time, you could actually quantify if bats are being decimated by white nose syndrome without ever even going to cave. We just use our acoustic data to understand if bats are being negatively affected. 
So all of this, guys, all this research is awesome. It's fun and it's it's great. But the one main message we want to share with you guys is bats are awesome. They're important for the ecosystem. And southeastern Idaho is like critical for bat conservation in all of Western North America. You drive 15, 20, 30 miles out in the desert and you are in like prime bat habitat, right? Hell's half acre, that where it's so. Uh, with that, I think that's all I have. If anybody has any questions or comments, I'll take those. Yes, sir. So, in regards to white mold syndrome, let's call it controlled access case. You know, when you go for a tour, you get a permit or anything, and say, Have you been in a cave the yeah. last year or whatever? Da, 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 da. And it's up to the individual to answer yes or no. It's like, Okay, I'm in a cave a year ago wearing this watch. And wearing these shoes, but there's no, I haven't seen any um, decontamination station. You know, so is there plans or proposals or anything to decontaminate before you go into a cave? So, yes, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has de decontamination uh, protocols that we follow. And when we go to caves, so researchers follow when we go into caves, and then also the caving community, those that recreate the caves, most of them are, are really good and they'll follow the same protocol. If you've been to Craters of the Moon, they ask you a similar thing, right? They say, Have you ever been to a cave? I and mean, if so, don't wear that stuff into the cave. If the Little Brown Myos gets listed under the Endangered Species Act, that's probably they're they're probably. There's going to be some changes in that kind of stuff because white nose syndrome is one that is decimating that species. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service may then work with Forest Service and BLM and say, no, we're going to start putting restrict potentially putting uh, restrictions on going into caves at certain times and also requiring decontamination. Just you know, you know, for instance, you know, the average citizen goes down to Great Basin and then goes to uh, Iowa or whatever the cave is down by. Yeah. And comes up here to Craters of the Moon. You know, there's, there's nothing being offered to them to make sure they're being contaminated. It's just take a word for it. Yep. And so Craters is, they pass out that little flyer. This is the last time I went there. And they basically say if you have been in a cave, we got to recognize that. If you're here in Idaho and just going around caves in Idaho, that's different than if you're coming from the East Coast, right? So the the thing with craters is we have people coming from all over the world, right? Going to craters. So, um, but they're a federal agency, and that's how they propose to deal with it is to, to trust people, which is great, right? And say, look, if, if you've been in the cave and you, you, you wore a coat or boots or whatever, please don't wear those in a cave, or, or please don't go in the cave, right? What's that? Is there is, yeah. So if you go to the US or the US Fish and Wildlife Service, they can just type in white house syndrome decontamination protocol, it'll come up and there's bleach, water mixtures, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, because I know what when I was doing, you know, the cross over to the southwest. Yeah, we had to decontaminate after everything we went into because it was <laughs> Yeah. So. Yeah. And then there's always the there's always the risk though that like the Boy Scout troop is going to go and get right like and so that's part of our talk and part of what we want to do is educate folks on white male syndrome and help them understand there are protocols that you follow to be contaminated if you if you do that kind of stuff. So, okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So um, you know, I recently went to a 17 mile cave and it, you know the graffiti there is awful and it reeks of paint. Was there a bat population that maybe used to be there and then left or moved in? Yeah. Yeah, yep, they're used to, I'm sure there were bats in Century Mile Cave. I've never been in Century Mile Cave, but it's comparable, <laughs> excuse me, a lot of the caves we have on the Idaho site and the desert. So, yeah, I'm sure there were probably bats in there at one time. Mm -hmm. That's another issue we have is cave vandalism, right? In a lot of caves, in another cave up where I'm from, Mike and Rexburg, um, civil defense cave. I don't know if you've been in there. It's just spray paint everywhere, and trash everywhere. And so that's something we, we that's that's a problem too that we can deal with. So, yep. So, I give you a question based on what's happened in the East. 
that the whiteness syndrome can really cause population level endangerment or yeah. illness. Um, what's your sense of when and how is that following this? Is it a challenge population level impact, or is it just yeah, so with Ori bats, actually, a couple of scientific peer reviewed papers come out recently basically predicting their extinction or a decrease of 90% by 20 or 30 years. The models differ, but yeah, oh yeah, Ori bats are, yeah, there, there, there will be population level impacts to that. Is there something that can be done in terms of trying to figure out what's attracting them to yeah, Bill brought this report out this night. There's a lot of research going on with this right now. So you can you can do cut-in speeds where you don't have the, the turbines going all the time, right? You can actually stop them for like a window or a week or two when the bats are potentially migrating through. They have, I don't know if this works before he's doing it, you might know this better, but they have uh, um, devices they put on the turbines that admit an uh, ultrasonic frequency that deters bats, some species. I remember it was effective on some, I can't remember which ones, but that actually deterred them, right? So Bill talked about this a little bit with the wind turbine. If you're a 40 bat, you're tree roosting, migrating bat coming through southeastern Idaho, these, these big features appear in your landscape, right? And it, it might be potential roosting habitat, might be potential foraging habitat. So the hypothesis is they're attracted to some of the, these large features in there. And also in perfect area where they're potentially using wind currents, right, to help with migration. And so there's a whole bunch of, and it'll differ by species, but that's kind of the idea. But yes, to answer your question, if the population level impacts. Where does that migrate to and how long does that That's a great question. We have, we have a lot of hypotheses of where they're going. Potentially coming out of Canada, Bill's thought, uh, had thoughts on this for a while, but coming down the Rocky Mountain chains and dropping down into the Snake River Plain and then flying across that and maybe dropping down in Nevada and California. We do know they, based on the genetic data and some other uh, stable isotope work, that they can, they're moving potentially from Canada to California, so kind of the north south. And then you can have little guys like the little brown myotis that can move up to 200, 300 kilometers seasonally. So maybe like wintering on the state uh, or wintering on the Yellowstone Plateau, maybe dropping down and coming down to the caves on the Snake River Plain, potentially, that kind of stuff. Anybody else? Any other questions? Bill, do you want to correct anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I guess I'm curious about the. Uh, you mentioned that that's an impact on global ecology. So then, back east where the that white nose wolf is impacted them more, what have you seen as far as impact on the ecology there? So, we, yeah, so a lot of research there. A lot of it's been looking at the, at least the stuff I've read, the shift in the community dynamics of bats. Now there's a void there. And so, you have other species that are increasing and filling that void. As far as the agriculture, I haven't seen, like, I don't know if anybody's done that. But the publication you cited talks about some of the potential impacts. Yeah, I've heard um, anecdotal reports of pesticide costs going up, but it's more like you're at the bat meeting during break at the bagels, and some scientists are talking to another scientist. Well, I heard over it, and so I don't know how much that's quantified, but at the scuttlebutt, you know, scientists and gossip like everybody else <laughs> is that um, they're noticing an area as an increase and also an absence of bats. I did some bat work back east um, for the Navy at uh, five or six naval installations. And it was the first time I'd done bat work back there since before White Nose. And, you know, as a bat biologist, the, you know, you're assessing conditions. The sun sets, it's starting to get dark, and it's really called bat time. You kind of get that feeling like, oh, bats are going to come. And it's like, no. It's like dead. And then every now and then a big brown or an evening bat um, or a silver haired or hoary bat. But um, 
just all the myotas were missing. Mm -hmm. And those are usually the dominant, at least in terms of numbers that you're hearing on a detector. Mm -hmm. That's usually the, you know, they're the they're the fluke section. Mm -hmm. um, and they weren't there, they were gone. And it was very eerie, it was very eerie. Um, something that was so common, like, you know, little brown myotis, it's like the white-footed deer mouse of bats. I mean, there's big, thick books about its biology, and they're just one of the most widely distributed bats. And um, habitat generalists can handle anything. Um, okay, living in cities, okay, living in suburbs, okay, living in the wilderness, able to handle it, able to coexist with humans very well. And they're going away. Um, it's really, um, I mean, it's deeply concerning as someone who's like spent a good part of their life dealing, you know, dealing with bats, researching them, appreciating them. You know, every, you know, every family camping trip for us has got bat detectors involved. Um, so they're just like a part of our, a part of my life, part of my family's life. I think that they would be gone. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny, my little, little guy was watching watching something on PBS and I was making a record for him and it was something about elephants and save the elephants. And, and they were talking about the last elephants on earth. And I, I yelled in, I said, it's worse than that. They're the last elephants in the universe. Um, they're not only the last elephants on earth, they're the last elephants in the universe. And then weeks later, he was watching something about blue whales. He said, dad, these are the last blue whales in the universe. And so, so these are the last bats in the universe. Um, and so I think we should, you know, really appreciate the gravity of, of what's going on. Not, I said I started preaching, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> but I think it's very important. It's a very important conservation topic. Yeah. I, I guess I was going to quantify the, the cost on the economy. I bet. Uh, I, I, maybe more interesting to generate that. Yeah, I think, I think um, there's probably work being done. Yeah, there's probably work being done. And I want to reach out to the ag industry, but I don't have any connections to try to see if I can connect them you know, more organic. They could actually use it for their marketing, mm -hmm. um, that they're bat friendly, or they put up bat houses, or they're reducing pesticides, or because um, I know they do it in California for coddling moths, which hit a number of agricultural crops. And so they put up bat houses, and then they actually popularize in their PR the benefits that they're doing. For the, for the back community. So, anyway. Yes, go ahead. I'm just curious as to what got you guys interested in bats in the first place. Why did, I get, why did you get interested? <laughs> so, I was working on the IMS site, and um, Bill was coming out and doing that work at the IMS site. And I'm a wildlife biologist, and, mm -hmm. and I knew the important resources we had on the IMS site for bats, and that kind of spawn this energy of the importance of this whole area for that. So once they started talking like BLM biologists, and IL fish and biologists, and just recognizing how important this area is for these species. And um, that's kind of what the, did it for me. And I, I study all kinds of animals, deer, bighorn sheep, bison, finger rabbits, border, whatever, right? But, and that's is. I mean, all a lot of wildlife species are having a hard time, right? So the more we can just help all the different species, that's, that's the better too. Yeah. So at that time, there wasn't hardly any bat work being done in the state, and we're pretty thin on on bat experts. I mean, Jericho is one now, but 12, 15 years ago, there was not very many people that knew anything about bats. And I was getting questions from the agencies about. Primarily wind development. And uh, I was trying to encourage them to start collecting data, and I couldn't seem to get them to pick up their kickstand and get moving. So I decided, well, I'm just going to do it. So I called fishing game regions around the state, and I borrowed bat detectors and equipment, and I built weatherproof housings in my garage. And I would go out, I'd leave work Friday, and I would go out, I'd put the detectors up. And then I would like camp in the desert badly um, and then bring them all back on, on Sunday afternoon. And uh, one of the places I reached out to for the possibility of doing bat detectors was INL. And so I connected with Jericho at that time and started collecting data on the site on, on bats. I was primarily looking for tree bat migration. And uh, 
I had a theory that they visit caves while they're migrating, and they do. We pick them up in caves. So as they pass through, they stop off at caves. Um, and so that was that. that. That's what got that rolling. But you know, you know, my mom has got pictures of me, you know, two years old with a with Batman cape and cow um, running around the Christmas tree. You know what I mean? Like, so apparently bats are part of my life, my whole life. And I remember I had like the, the golden book of bats. <laughs> and um, and then just by chance I got offered an opportunity to work on 10 bigger bats on my graduate work. Um, I wasn't seeking a bat project, but I just connected with bat biologists. And um, that was about 30 years ago. And I've been doing bats ever since. In terms of one more quick question, what was the last thing you did? I don't know. I don't know. I 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 Bruce trees being cut. Yep, yeah, it is, and Bill talked about that. But um, the mining and sealing of mines is going to be there's going to be a continual issue, especially if the middle ground mines is listed. And of course, those BLM will have to, have to do an assessment before they can potentially seal a mine. One thing that uh, is interesting in the Western US and Idaho in particular, these large scale fires were having. That changes the dynamic of the whole ecosystem potentially, right? And what type of effect that's having, uh, we don't know yet, but that's that's definitely something that's probably having an effect on that. Right. We I think we've got to cut off the formal, we've got to cut off the zoom right now, but I'm sure Phil and Derek will hang out for a few minutes if anyone would like to continue. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome.